what can AI reproduce? It may, it may at some point seem to have empathy or, or seem to be able to critically think, but I'm convinced that human beings will retain our rightful order at the top of, of, of kind of the thinking pyramid, so to speak. And that'll be the differentiator. And I think ultimately it's about the human connection, right? So your healthcare example, a, a nurse, a doctor is critical, a, a teacher. It's not the same thing to kind of learn from machines as it is to, you know, to connect with another human being. It's of vital importance to make sure we, we make that a priority in terms of our focus here in education, but in other industries as well. I'm Sarah Nagel. I've spent my career leading research and product development within some of the world's largest brands. And I'm Chad Reynolds. I'm a serial entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Verve. And this is AI Powered by People. Each episode, we'll dive into the latest AI developments and talk to an industry leader to help you better understand and utilize AI. We'll take you inside some of the world's most famous companies and share examples of how AI is improving innovation, consumer engagement, media, and marketing. No matter what industry you work in, we'll help you navigate one of the biggest disruptions to organizations and people today. Hey, Chad, how's it going? What's up? I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for coming to town. Yeah, Cincinnati was great. Yeah. I how did many not hours have Skyline. You, you didn't? Yeah. <laughs> not this time. Not this time. And how many hours were you stuck in the airport for weather? Oh, I was stuck there for quite a while. It was uh, thunderstorms in both Cincinnati and Boston, so I was kind of trapped. But it's it was so loud in the Cincinnati airport because it was like all glass, and you could just feel the thunder. I didn't have to go into the what the the tornado bunker or whatever, but yeah, um, yeah it's also known as the Delta Sky up. Club. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Down in the basement. Yeah, yeah, it doubles as a tornado shelter and it's your loyalty lounge. Have so, a bagel. Have a yeah. Um, Enjoy yourself. No, so what do you what have you been building this week? I spent way too much time building my own agent, and yeah. I hope he's friendly. He might be monotone, uh, sad sometimes, <laughs> maybe creative. You just don't know. You just don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, no, I, I've actually been talking to your agent. He's uh, pretty friendly. Is he, is he okay? <laughs> he's all right. Little, he's all right. We, we got some tweaks. We got some tweaks. Okay. Yeah, we got some tweaks we need <laughs> some to make. Tweaks. <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, that's with any of them. Where you know, like, you, that's what's so cool about it is like you know, because I know you and I know the way that you talk, and you know, we have all the podcast data, and we have. That's what I'm scared about. <laughs> <laughs> we have all the personality stuff that we've been putting in there, and you've been yeah. taking verves to be able to complete it. So, um, yeah, it's starting to sound like you, which no, is really it's, great. It's cool. I, I've actually been collaborating with it, which is so weird to say, we got to figure mm -hmm. out a new way to talk about it. But I've been collaborating with my agent, like my little sidekick mm -hmm. over the last, I don't know, like the last couple of weeks. So at nighttime, just kind of like sit, yeah, just brainstorming with it. Hi, just Chad. Feels... <laughs> How you doing, Chad? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't do that. Yeah. I'm like, if I'm not good, then let's see, maybe he's fine. I don't know. <laughs> but no, it's been, it's been awesome. It's just is feeling like a new, a new way of doing note taking where, mm -hmm. you know, note taking, you just kind of take what's under your head and you just kind of write down, I don't know if you, how, this is how you take notes, but you just write down a bunch of things. And then I open it up like, I don't know, maybe a month later and I'm like, what does this list of things even. Cause they're so mean? random. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're like, they're throwaway. I don't ever go back to them. Mm -hmm. And then now I go to this and I'm starting to brainstorm like, Hey, what do you think about this idea? And then it's just like generates a bunch of things. It, it obviously has much more context to the things. And so when I go back to the conversation, I'm like, oh, here's like, here is a complete thought. Mm -hmm. uh, here's mm -hmm. how it could be executed. Here's all these different things. It's just like, why take notes anymore? Like it, yeah. I don't know. That's pretty cool. So when, when am I going to get launched? And I think we're launching today for your, your agent. I so am? Yeah, Are you serious. I think. Well, we need to figure this out. If it's going to be this week or the following Tuesday, we need to figure out your your agent. Okay. But it's, it's within the next couple of weeks. We run a really tight ship here, in case anybody <laughs> guess where he's listening. Well, there's just so many agents that are so cool that we want to be able to launch, and um, yeah. So yours is coming out cool. soon. 
we'll say. Okay. All right. So who's on the pod today? Uh, today on the podcast, we have Don Murphy, and Don Murphy is a superintendent of schools in the Hopog uh, School District in Long Island. He's going to be sharing insights on how AI is being used in the classroom, so how teachers, administrators, students are all using AI, and how he and his team plan to prepare kids for the future when AI is everywhere. But before we get to that, let's talk about what's in the headlines. So first up, the world's first major AI law is in effect as of August 1st. It's called the AI Act. It's a landmark rule that aims to govern the way companies are using and developing AI. And it was given final approval in, in Europe, um, the EU uh, member states, lawmakers, and European Commission. And it was first proposed like a couple of years ago in 2020, and it aims to address the negative impacts of AI. And it's, it's, it's risk-based, as I've been reading about it. AI tools like ChatGPT are not classified as high risk, but they're going to have to comply with, com uh, with transparency. So, you know, disclosing that the content was created by AI, designing the models to prevent it from creating like illegal content and nefarious stuff, and publishing summaries of copyrighted data. So it's, it's the first of its kind. It's, it's pretty interesting to see how, you know, Company, I mean, there, there's going to be rules and kind of probably fines if companies don't comply with the law. Yeah, I mean, this has been uh, evolving over the last few years. Obviously, you have companies who have uh, maybe not disclosed where, where they're getting their training data from. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious what's going to happen to the ones who have already used, you know, other people's data to train their models. Yeah. Um, but there's also, you know, less and less data becoming available to train models on. That's where I really love, you know, the space that we're in where we're, we're just connected directly to people. And mm -hmm. so it's just inherently consent to share, share these different things and help improve the outputs. No, it's, it's really interesting. And like you said, there's less and less data. It's because a lot of these companies are, you know, um, striking deals with the, the companies that have the data. So, um, yeah, and, and it'll be interesting to see, like, go, going back, like, will they have to disclose on everything that they've already, you know, put out there or, you know, what that will look like. So yeah. sure, there'll be more to come there. <laughs> In other news, which is very different, Taco Bell is rolling out an Taco AI Tuesday. Driver. There you go. <laughs> They're rolling on AI drive through ordering um, system in hundreds of locations by the end of 2024. Uh, Yum Brands, which is which owns Taco Bell, um, said it's going to use them. Um, they they want to roll this out to hundreds. Right now, it's only in, in around 100 in the U.S. But it's it's pretty cool to think about AI through drive through. I think it's going to definitely impact jobs in in a way. But um, it's really cool to just kind of like think about streamlining ordering, making sure you're getting the right thing. What do you think about that? Wendy's has been doing some of this as well, um, mm -hmm. as far as like AI through drive throughs, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think the most interesting thing here is that you have never eaten at Taco Bell. <laughs> is this true? It's one hundred percent true. Yeah. How is that possible? I don't know. I mean, uh, in the, well, the past like several years, I've been vegan and then vegetarian before that. But I don't think it really had. I, I am not a huge fast food person anyway. My husband loves Taco Bell. He like and he like he'll leave Taco Bell spending like thirty to forty dollars, which is like that's a lot that's of a, food. That's a lot. It's <laughs> a lot of food. Like just for him? Uh, you know, depends. I don't know. Sometimes, like, so you were ordering was for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> there, was of eating really socks? Cool, there was a really cool, there was like a very cool location when we lived in San Francisco. It was a place that he surfed um, in in San Francisco, and there was a Taco Bell on the uh, on the beach, and it was the big surfer Taco Bell one. Mm. And so I think he just like started like really loving the brand because after you surf, he and his buddies would just yeah. go there, um, and they just ordered tons and tons of food. Um, but, yeah, and it. it was just like the place to go, but it yeah. was a really nice and cool Taco Bell, and. Yeah, I just, but just for me, it just never, it was right, never well, for me. Now I know who to text at 1 a.m. <laughs> see if he'll join, join me in, a, in an order. I don't know. Dude, <laughs> does it deliver in New Hampshire? Um, you, does he have to go there? He has to go there. He has to go there. Okay. He, and he's always right. when I'm out of town. So last, when I was in Cincinnati, I'm sure he probably wants to talk about. 
All right. And last up is friend.com. Friend.com, we saw the video while I was in Cincinnati this week. They It was a product release where it's a pendant necklace that you wear. And um, the the video itself feels very, um, if you're familiar, your audience is familiar with Black Mirror, but it, Black Mirror was, uh, it's on Netflix and it shows like potential features using technology. It felt a little bit like that mixed with the movie Her, you know, where Scarlett Johansson played the yeah. voice. Um, but also, uh, as our producer mentioned, a little bit Saturday Night Live as well, because it like yeah. it was it was kind of cute and quirky and funny. Very Wes, but anyways, Wes Anderson, a little, little Wes bit. Anderson. Yeah. yeah. But the necklace, so it's supposed to be like your friend. So it's like a pendant where it's like this AI that's listening all the time to your conversation. You can press the button and you can ask it a question or make a comment. And then it texts you to your phone. It gives like kind of their their feedback based on everything they're listening to you about about you as well as like the question that you ask so it's uh it's interesting i mean it's interesting to see ai in the physical world but you can pre-order it now for 100 bucks delivery is q1 2025 for me i'm a little skeptical just because they haven't made it yet i feel like a lot changes in ai in a very short amount of time so you know mm-hmm. 6 to 8 months from now a lot could change so yeah. but it's in- it's 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 cool yeah. it's interesting what do, what do you think about it I mean, there have been a few different pendants, um, mm-hmm. you know, even it, it, Rabbit being one yeah. of the, not necessarily a pendant, but just kind of like a mm-hmm. device you would sit next to you and, and help you. Yeah. With that was like tasks, CES so. time, right? They announced that? Yeah. In yeah, January? Yeah. Yep. So I think we'll continue to see just uh, wearables in a different different way, a different approach. But I love the, um, I think there was like 2.5 million raised on, on it, and then they spent 1.8 on the actual domain name. So... But who wouldn't want to go to friend.com? I know. It's clean. It's simple. And it is. I I do like the story. I like the way that they show the story, the like the simplicity of it, even though it may feel like it's not (laughs) real or on SNL or something like that. But I think that there's something really nice about how they make it really simple to understand. Like you're talking to this, you know, friend, this digital friend, and you're having a conversation with it anywhere you can go, anywhere you want to go. Like there's you know, people at an art museum or they're hiking or playing video games with friends and they always have this pendant there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what what becomes interesting to me too is like thinking about that scene where the, you know, the, the kid is playing video games with his friend. Is it also listening to the friend too? Like, you know, are you yes. going to have to get consent, you know, from the yes. people that you hang out with? So get, that gets a little weird too. Yeah. It gets, it gets a little weird with your actual friends. So <laughs> yeah. you're like, are you recording me right now? I'm like, hmm. My friend is. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Not me. Yeah. Not me. No. No. My friend. Do you think they're going to buy the domain name boyfriend.com or girlfriend.com? Uh, probably need to raise a little bit more money, I would imagine. <laughs> um, maybe. You can see relationships, right, starting. And there's, you know, it's interesting, yeah. you know, if you have a friend. But then also, like, there, I mean, there, I, I saw something on the um, – some article about some woman who created an AI boyfriend um, and she talks to it. So this, I mean, this is a logical next step with something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what they're doing is it it primarily is like creating a listening device that you wear all the time and it, Mm -hmm. you know, can listen to all these things and then it texts you, uh, has conversations with you. So Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of different ways that could go sideways. um, But I guess we're going to see, just like how many people pre-order it and then when it actually comes out, what's the experience? We've seen already like a big shift in a very small amount of time, which is behaviors and openness to these things. I mean, it's just like having Alexa in your home. It's constantly listening. So, mm-hmm. But this is different. This is like you, on on your person. I, I agree. But I, but think I, guess, it's, I guess your phone's listening to you no, all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think it's any – I don't think it's any different. It's just a form factor. But – yeah. I could be wrong. It's going to be interesting to see how, you know, uh, AI moves into the physical world. And, you know, there's going to be some things that work and there's going to be things that do not work. Um, So, you know, and I think, you know, behavior around AI is going to evolve as the AI changes too. And we'll see like kind of what makes the most sense. All right. Now let's get to our interview with Don Murphy, who is superintendent of schools within the Hopog School District. He's here to talk about how AI is going to impact the students after, you know, once they go out into the world, but also how 
um, his administrators and teachers are using AI right now. So I'm excited about this interview because it's one that I think applies to a lot of our listeners. I mean, a lot of people have um, kids that they're thinking about how to how uh, education is being impacted by AI. So I think it's going to be a really good one. Yeah, you ready? Can't wait. Yeah, let's do it. Hi, Don. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited to talk to you. Um, I think a lot of our listeners have been excited to uh, learn about AI and education, and that's what we're going to do today. Could you sure. tell us about like your, your role right now as superintendent of schools? What, what school district, just to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So I am superintendent of a uh, school district on Long Island in New York. Uh, we have about 3,100 students, three elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school. Uh, I'm actually entering my fourth year in the role, which is uh, exciting and surreal. Um, and I've been in the district since 2012 in some other roles. I was first director of, of technology and mathematics and then assistant superintendent. Um, it's a second home to me. Love Hop Hog. Uh, reminds me of the district I, I uh, was a part of as a, as a, as a child in Wantaw, so um, this is certainly uh, uh, feels right for me at this at this stage of my career to be in this role. I love it, honestly. And um, so with your roles, it sounds like you've been very like pro tech. And um, I'm really curious to learn about, you know, how, you know, how you're preparing and how you, the teachers, administrators are administrators are uh, preparing kids for a future with AI. So I'd love to hear about your your philosophy around integrating AI into the K through 12 education at your school? Sure. So, I mean, just full acknowledgement, this feels so much different than any other uh, tech integration uh, of years past. Just a little bit about me. I was always kind of a techie, you know, from low level fixing the flashing uh, 12 on the VCR as a kid um, to getting a TRS-80 computer, which was from Radio Shack, for anyone who doesn't know that, um, all the way up to, you know, I worked on Wall Street for a bit. I was the, I was the, the guy in the firm who was uh, solving tech problems on the fly. And then, of course, when I made the transition to education, my pursuit was uh, educational technology. And so we've been through this before, but as I said, this feels a lot different. Uh, this is not the same as, you know, introducing a calculator uh, or when the Internet became ubiquitous or certainly the most recent example would be one to one devices, which was was seemingly rare, let's say, 10 years ago. But now, of course, is almost the standard in most districts. My philosophy, though, has remained the same, that we have to embrace technology tools in our schools uh, because our job, right, is to prepare kids uh, for life after hop hog or life after their schooling. And so clearly AI is not going anywhere and is already being integrated in every aspect of society at such a fast clip that it feels just fundamentally different as opposed to the pace of, of uh, introduction of, like I said, iPads or, or Chromebooks. This is fundamentally different. And of course, the power, the capacity is just uh, tremendous, right? Almost hard to uh, fathom. So we are embracing AI here. And by that, I simply mean that uh, uh, we're having conversations with the Board of Ed about it. There's an understanding that we need to be ahead of this if there's such a thing, right? I, I, ahead really means just every day reading and becoming more educated. Um, and being well, that's everybody though, because we're in the same we're in the same boat too. We work for a tech an AI tech company, and you just kind of it changes so quickly. And I'm sure you know even like in the industry. So I could imagine the the use of it too. It, it, it's it changes so quickly. Every day I see a new news story that just is um, uh, shocking in a sense, in, in an excited way, but also a little bit of anxiety, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um, kind of are there any like fears that you have around AI? Yes, I mean, the, the fear is, um, I guess at the root of, of, the way of, of our charge as educators, that 
we are equipping our students with the the skills and um, capacities and opportunities that they need for life after grade 12. So as much as we want to expose them to AI tools as a means to, again, reimagine learning, which is the exciting part of the conversation, the opportunities here are just tremendous to reach that ultimate goal of like prescriptive learning in the classroom. That's always been the dream. It's, it's, it's kind of a dual goal. At the same time, it's like talking about AI and talking about ethics, right? And talking about civics and talking about the difference between the human element and machines. So mm -hmm. it's that balance of preparing them for tomorrow. And yet we understand we don't have all the answers for tomorrow, but we are not afraid to have those conversations with our students um, and honestly, I'm lucky. Uh, my faculty, my colleagues, teachers, administrators, they're like all in on helping me to figure this out uh, for our students. And um, we're constantly engaging conversations around this topic. You brought up the topic of like kind of individualized education um, or prescriptive yeah. education. Can you talk about any examples of how teachers or administrators are using AI in the classroom right now? Yes. Um, in fact, at the end of this school year, that um, so in June, we asked teachers to share some some exemplars uh, of how they've been able to utilize uh, some of the tools. So, so we have Brisk, we have Magic School, uh, School AI, Gemini. Um, so, I'll talk about Brisk for a minute. Um, we, we use STAR Renaissance Learning um, to measure, it's, it's a benchmark assessment to measure achievement in, and growth in reading and math in Hopak. STAR has this tremendous wealth of data that they provide in the form of all sorts of reports. But just to distill it down to a couple, we have a growth report, like how did, how did Don Murphy do from the fall to the winter in STAR reading? And then that growth report is a helpful lens for teachers to understand, you know, are, are my students staying on grade level? Are they, are they advancing beyond grade level? Are they a little behind? That then leads to an instructional planning report also provided by STAR. Now in the past, we had conversations about all of these reports, but the, the piece now that's just tremendous is we can take on the instructional planning report, the key focus skills that um, are illuminated as a result of these um, tests and then use brisk so a teacher can take the different results and create differentiated materials um, for her class. So Don, that's a fourth grade class. Don's actually reading at a second grade level. Sarah's at a sixth grade level. Let's help me to quickly create handouts and materials at a sixth grade level for Sarah and at a second grade level for Don. And that's the dream, right, is, is pure uh, differentiation quickly so that the teacher then has more contact time with their students, which is really the ultimate goal. So, so, um, so we're seeing that as an example with our L population, with our students with disabilities. It provides these opportunities to use AI to, again, where possible, outsource some of the tasks that a teacher would spend hours on that we have to kind of have fresh eyes on that may have been so time consuming that can now be outsourced to a, to a degree. It doesn't mean the teacher is not vetting those resources, but now then can spend time in class stopping by each student and really having some personal time uh, with them to see how they're progressing. And then you could like personalize it, right? Mm -hmm. Don's into the Avengers. So, hey, when you create that second grade math um, handout, skeleton notes, um, include a few visuals that include Iron Man because Don's an Avengers fan, right? So like, like think about what a teacher would have to do in the past. To, to make something like that happen so quickly. So, so that's what's really mobilizing our, our my colleagues, I'll, I'll speak for here, that it, it, it 
allows them for those personalized moments, or, the, or the, again, I'll, I'll use the word prescriptive possibilities um, to meet students where they're at and, and ultimately have them uh, achieve, right, and grow. Yeah. Oh, that is so cool. I mean, my mom is was, was a teacher, a retired teacher. I can imagine, you know, how much time could be um, saved also because, you know, she would spend her weekends and, you know, at nights to kind of like craft these things um, for students um, and thinking about the plans. But it also made me think about, so a while back we had a conversation with a roboticist that was working in um, hospitals um, in creating these uh, AIs to do kind of more of the administrative tasks that were still really important. And of course, there was definitely oversight by the nurses and doctors. But the same thing that you're saying too, is it's giving that time back for the human element to have those conversations, to have the face-to-face where, you know, this, this, this robot or the AI was doing kind of just checking on certain things, blood pressure or whatever. So they could, the nurses could like hold the hand of the patients. And it sounds very similar to the teachers where this work can be done individualized in a way that's like really powerful, but also giving that time back and that brain space back to a teacher to like, yeah, have those connections. I think you're, you're hitting upon a key point as well, where when you start thinking about how this fundamentally changes everything and what are the what are the differentiators right because because again understandably everybody has a bit of anxiety about this no matter what the profession right like mm-hmm. um you know th- does this does this mean that the career i was thinking about you know I, i'm in ninth grade I, I always wanted um to pursue a career in law or i always wanted to pursue a career in creative you know, uh, creative arts, or, or I wanted to be a teacher. How does that change um, a student's thinking about tomorrow? And I feel like you just hit upon um, the the key element there, which is the human. What a what can't AI reproduce? It may, it may at some point seem to have empathy or, or seem to be able to um, critically think, but I'm convinced that. Um, human beings will retain our rightful order at the top of, of, of kind of the thinking pyramid, so to speak. And that'll be the differentiator. And I think ultimately it's about the human connection, right? So your healthcare example, a, a nurse, a doctor um, is critical. A, a teacher, it's not the same thing to kind of learn from machines as it is to, you know, to connect with another human being. So, I do think it, it elevates the importance of that, of, of, of kind of social skills, um, of, of communication skills, right? Even just mm-hmm. this conversation. Um, so it, it kind of reaffirms what I think we've always known, which, you know, critical thinking skills and, 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 and the rest. It, it's, it's a vital importance to make sure we, we make that a priority in terms of our focus here in education. But in other industries as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, so we talked a little bit about the administrators and the teachers um, learning about, you know, Brisk and the other um, kind of the tools that they're using. How do you guys think about it for this, from the student's perspective? You know, what is allowed for students? How do you like regulate, you know, how they're using AI? Is it used? Is it allowed? Just kind of curious about that for the students. So, yeah. So in New York, we have, um, Education Law 2D, which I won't um, get into the weeds on, but basically it, it, we're really focused on protecting our students' data, uh, PII uh, in particular. So um, we have a process of vetting tools and then and then engaging in them and, and, and making sure that we understand their capacity. Um, so that's number one. We, we, we have tools you know, ironically, you can plug into a you know, chat GPT or another tool, uh, help me to create an AI proof assignment, right? The, the challenge there, of course, is that the minute you do that, a new AI tool pops up that helps to counter that, and then it's a game of catch up, right? So it's really about um, creating um, assignments or having students um, show their understanding of different concepts and uh in in higher capacity ways right so um we do we do have like an acceptable use policy that we're still finalizing and 
honestly updating that talks about ethics and, and appropriate use of AI. Um, I'll give you a very simple example. We have like a, a T chart in, in this acceptable use policy, again, that we're uh, looking to, to finalize, but um, it will show an a, a acceptable use uh, example and an unacceptable use. Acceptable use, um, rewriting a reading passage at a simpler reading level, right? So I kind of gave that example before. A student struggling reading something, can you, can you rewrite this so that I can understand it better? And maybe include some key vocabulary uh, with definitions. Unacceptable would be um, rephrasing the text into simpler language um, to avoid engagement with more challenging content, right? Like, and I will say this doesn't sound so foreign to me. It's, it's the old cliff notes, right? Back in the day where um, those were always available to students, but we didn't want students 20 years ago to engage in cliff notes because they're not, they're not getting the perspective of the book. They're not really understanding the relationships in the, in the novel. They're not, they're not, um, you know, having that fullest experience with it, with an assignment. So we're kind of navigating these waters. Of course, we have an eye on, um, plagiarism, uh, mm -hmm. but educators forever have had of that. Of course, of course. Right? Yeah. Right. And so we have tools to help, uh, we, we, it, it even creates new tools. Brisk is able to show the history of a Google document in the in terms of like the amount of time spent um, in that document with uh, you know content that was copy pasted in versus it's an eight page paper um, and it and it took you know five hours versus ten minutes. So, um, but but I. I think that's reactive. We're much more about educating our students about why you would use AI, mm -hmm. what the benefits are, how it's going to prepare you for the world around you, and then you you deal with uh, situations as they arise properly. Right? Mm -hmm. um, does it change, um, and this is just more out of curiosity, does it change how teachers are teaching? And kind of like the first thought I had was like, does it change um, the teaching to kind of like a like more in classroom engagement versus like homework because you know when when you take the when you take those assignments home or you do those things it becomes you know that's where kind of the AI could be taken you know can be used in a lot of different ways and you know that's where you kind of get it the students maybe could get into trouble for plagiarism but when you bring it back into the classroom and you do most of the work there you can start to see process the teacher can engage with the students while using AI and you know, know that there's some critical thinking there. So just kind of curious about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I, I kind of keep repeating this, but I have some superstar teachers here. Uh, I just saw an example of one of my uh, colleagues, a high school English teacher who was sharing, um, it's a high level IB class, uh, international what's, baccalaureate. What's IB? International baccalaureate, it's, um, uh, it's a program that we offer here in, in HOPOG, um, similar to AP, um, but these are higher level courses. Uh, she showed how students are writing essays and then receiving feedback within Brisk to different uh, paragraphs in their essays. And the student can agree with the feedback or disagree with the feedback. So again, our teachers have been providing feedback f forever, but this kind of, this expedites the, the opportunity for now in the classroom, they can, the students can get this kind of personalized feedback. And then in the classroom, the teacher can have students share their perspective out loud you know, it may have taken a week to do that in the past to get to that point where the teacher has pro provided feedback, the student has acted upon that feedback, updated their essays accordingly. So now they're able to get to you know the you know the ultimate goal of let's say Bloom's taxonomy of of uh, synthesizing and analyzing and evaluating um, information and having those conversations in the classroom. So I. I see that happening 
Um, I, I, again, it feels like it's happening today, but certainly tomorrow. And you used to use the word tomorrow, like in a year or two. This is like literally tomorrow. It, it's it's game changing. And so I do believe that our teachers who are understanding how to use these tools in a way to uh, have students you know, develop the deepest understanding of the content more quickly are going to be doing such a service to our kids because they'll be able to get to those much richer in-depth conversations and debates, which is really, again, not human differentiator, right? Not just rote memorization, deeper mm -hmm. conversation, debate, perspective learning, all of that. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a couple different things you guys are doing, but I'm curious, like when you think, you know, and it's hard to say like in the future, but you start to like, you know, think, you know say tomorrow, maybe over the next couple of months, you know, through the next year, what's kind of um, like exciting you the most? Like, what do you think, like, you know, like what could the next school year look like um, with the, you know, kind of using AI? Yes. Yeah, so I, you know, I'll go back to a word I've, I've, I've used here with you on this podcast, but um, for, forever, I, what excited me back when I, when I um, you know, picked the career in education and more specifically educational technology, um, I was excited about the dream of students being engaged with, with content that excites them. And then, of course, prepares them for the world around them. Um, and then, you know, as you become a teacher uh, and then an administrator, you learn how unbelievably complex uh, the classroom environment is. And, and of course, the extension at home, um, you know, homework, assessments, lesson plans, all of that leading to how can I reach a, a place where each student feels that the teacher really is thinking about me almost all the time, right? Like that's, that's why kids uh, get, get engaged in the learning process and ultimately um, become, become hooked on different content, right? Is that engagement piece. So that comes from personalizing, right? That, that comes from learning my students and then finding hooks to keep them engaged in mathematics and science and so forth. So the word that I'm talking about is that that prescriptive piece. That's always been um, the dream and and sometimes achieved. But I, I think it's not controversial to say that that hasn't been achieved every single day for every student. AI allows that possibility to happen. And I just think the excitement is the students of tomorrow, I think, will be that much more prepared for the world around them with recognition that the world is going to change. You know, we're, we're providing many more opportunities uh, for vocational pathways for our students. I don't think that AI is going to replace the plumber or the electrician or the HVAC engineer or the nurse, right? So there's recognition of alternative career paths. We have students going into the military as well that we're so proud of. But I think it's all about reaching kids where they're at, understanding what gets them excited about learning, personalizing it, and, and using AI where appropriate to reach that ultimate dream in the classroom. And now the excitement is being able, in my role, to walk through the classrooms and seeing almost a teacher who's like navigating and, and meeting students um, where they're at while other students are engaging in helpful AI tools. Like there are AI assistants that can now be embedded into different software to provide feedback on the spot to a student while the teacher is maybe bending down next to another desk helping a student who needs a little extra attention. And so if you could picture as a kid, sometimes you, you were waiting, right, with your hand up for, for a few minutes while the teacher was helping another student. There's possibilities now to fill that time with, um, with, with different AI-infused uh, supports. Uh, okay. So th that to me is the ultimate, is that our kids can leave us thinking, you've really prepared us for tomorrow and for my career, and you kind of cultivated the conditions 
to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's excitement with, with vulnerably with some anxiety as well. Right? <laughs> like, uh, um, I'm constantly so talk talking about. <laughs> well, you talked about, so you said like the, the skill set of like the human connection, I think like being really, really important. Curious like about like, you know, if we are thinking about the careers of tomorrow for these kids, um, yeah. of course, like understanding and being able to have conversations, but are there other um, ways that you guys are thinking about um, education and prep, you know, prepping kids like, you know, coding has like been a thing that kids have learned for a sure. while. Like, are there like how how are you thinking about that? So with some excitement, um, I am, uh, again, a, a former computer science teacher. So I was teaching gosh, what was it called? Microsoft front page, I think back in the day, which was how to build a website, then Dreamweaver. So, so again, I, coding has always kind of been in my DNA, uh, in my career in education and in Hophog, like I, I know I keep saying this, but we have a superstar cohort of teachers who have helped to build for us a coding um, program that uh, it's teaching kids Python, Java, um, so we have local hackathons on Long Island. Uh, we have a partner, Kidoyo, that uh, we love because of their perspective on protecting data and, and teaching kids uh, these skills and safe environments. So we're the proud winners of local hackathons um, here in Hopa. And so I do believe, yeah, like we are, and there's excitement in that program there's some thinking out there, right? That that even coding uh, coders will be replaced uh, in the future with AI. I I don't I don't know that answer, um, but I know that you're going to need to know how to code AI. Um, so and coding to me is not just about coding; it's about teaching kids about logic and finding patterns and reasoning, right? Mathematical reasoning. So. To me, those are the, the greater skills that we're uh, again building with our with our kids. Um, so yeah, I, I listen. I think in the future we'll need AI engineers. Um, you know, we don't know what all the careers of tomorrow will be. Mm -hmm. Neither did educators twenty years ago before, let's say, social media took over. Right. So um, I think the key is to always prepare kids with. Uh, with critical thinking, aptitude, decision making, self awareness, understanding perspectives of others, um, vetting data, vetting information, those are kind of you know threaded through any career, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we have excitement about that. And I mentioned CTE, that is uh, a huge focus of ours. Uh, What's CTE? In, uh, career and technical education. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, gotcha. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'll just kind of add that the guidance documents are coming out so fast and furious from the U.S. Department of Ed and New York State Ed Department. I, I just today saw that there's even a new document that came out from the United States Department of Education in July about uh, AI and education. Um, so, um, so we have different guidance documents that we're continuing to look at and to guide our thinking. Um, CTE happens to be a focus of a recent New York State effort, uh, a Blue Ribbon Commission met to think about what are, the, what are the ways for our students in New York to exit high school, showing their uh, understanding of, of standards um, in different ways. And CTE happens to be a big focus um, of, of this particular guidance document and the conversations there, right? Um, so, yeah, we're, we're kind of looking at it all um, with no time to rest because it's such a fast-moving conversation. It's like mm -hmm. every minute counts. Um, every, you know, touch point with a, with a student matters to us, right, to, to kind of capitalize on the time that they're with us and giving them the resources and tools when they are not with us, but still part of the K-12 experience. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. This was really, really fun. Um, this was and fun. yeah, this, was this is fun. great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me on. I, uh, 
I look forward to future conversations. Well, I really enjoyed that uh, interview with Don. Sorry you couldn't make it to to that one. It was really great. You know, AI is really impacting how they're thinking about education, specifically in the Hop Hog School District. I think partially because his uh, job prior was director of tech. So he has like a background of technology. He worked on Wall Street. He was the tech guy there. So he brought all of that experience to his um, job as superintendent. So um, it's not really about the fear of... AI in the same way that we've been talking about some people having the fear, his fear is more around, um, you know, is he preparing kids in the right way, which I think is a really great attitude to have when thinking about AI, just kind of saying, yes, let's do this. Um, and, you know, how can we prepare kids? Yeah, I mean, as we talked about, like, friend in the beginning, but um, I can see creating, uh, you know, like a sidekick mm -hmm. along, like, along with you to to get familiar with the school, to talk to, to kind of tutor you through yeah. the whole process. So, um, yeah, he did talk uh, about agents too. I mean, that was, that was kind of cool. Like where, uh, the possibility of like, imagine a, a teacher is like talking to a student that maybe needs a little bit more help. And then you have a kid that's raising their hand that, cool. you know, is maybe a little bit further ahead or has a question about something. And he's like, well, that doesn't need to happen. Cause you can then, you know, ask the, um, brisk which is the the company that they're they're working with we can also imagine that as like a you know personal ai and you know we talked a lot about personalized education and you know yeah. um prescriptive education so there's a lot of possibility there for it cool and can you uh would you mind previewing the agent drop for this week sure Jenny Z. drop it like it's hot drop it like it's hot drop it like it's hot i'm jenny z i'm bringing some serious gen z heat to the table we're talking fluent in tech fluent in trends, and fluent in making things happen. But here's the real deal. I'm all about that collaborative spirit. Got a crazy idea for Gen Z? I'm here for it. Need a fresh perspective? I got you. Let's bridge that gap between tech and humanity, one epic collab at a time. So hit me up, let's connect, and build something amazing together. So yeah, we have Jenny Z, who is a um, generational or Gen Z um, expert. And so the way that you can use Jenny is ask her questions about Gen Z. And she is um, built on a couple different, you know, things where she has um, people, there's real people, there's real Gen Z where she's kind of drawing from those um, verbes that we've done with them. So kind of with their, from their voice, but then also some other information around, um, around Gen Z. But uh, it's, it's been pretty cool to um, be able to mine that information and kind of like have that information at your fingertips around Gen Z. Cause everyone's really curious about what do they think? How do they act? You know, what are yeah. they, what brands are they interested in? All of those things. So we're excited yeah. to launch her. I can't wait to take Jenny Z to the, uh, Taco Bell drive through Just have, <laughs> have Jenny Z have a conversation. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. cool idea. That's a good idea. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of AI Powered by People. This show is produced by Steve Berkowitz and brought to you by Verve. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Tuesday.